Mandrake, do you recall what Clemenceau once said about war? He said war is too important to be left to the generals. When he said that, fifty years ago he may have been right. But today, war is too important to be left to the politicians. They have neither the time, the training, nor the inclination for strategic thought. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all our precious bodily fluids. And too important to be left to the generals or the politicians is presidential war. Presidential war. Hello and welcome to the Dead Presidents Podcast. I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. And I'm James J. Hamilton. And we're back with another exciting installment of Presidential War. America's favorite discussion, presidential, intellectual card game. Indeed. Um, the of course, there's card game of the Dead Presidents Podcast. That's right. And of course, there's several iterations of presidential war. This time we're going to go with the five card draw variety. We each have drawn five cards and we'll be able to make a choice on our categories that come up. The first of which being who would you pick first in flag football? I have one clear choice. I'm going with Jerry Ford. Jerry Ford. Man, the best card for this category. I went with James Garfield. Garfield, a uh, pretty fit Civil War general. Uh, definitely uh, stayed in shape, but Jerry Ford mm. could have gone a different path and been a professional football player so yep jerry ford our number one presidential athlete of course uh, was the all-american at michigan yeah and uh, turned down a chance to play in the nfl yeah he was courted, he was courted by both the green bay packers and the detroit lions mm -hmm. went mm -hmm. to law school and instead and the rest is history and speaking of history James Garfield is history. That's right. Because Jerry Ford is going to take that category. Ford will tackle Garfield to the ground. Indeed. Next up, we got post-presidential accomplishments. Of course, we have to play our five cards as they dwindle down. That's it. The options get narrower for post-presidential accomplishments. I'm going Martin Van Buren. Not a bad card. And I went Herbert Hoover. Uh, so, well, with Hoover, uh, not a great run as president. No. But post-presidency, his advice was still... I don't know I don't know if I want to necessarily say sought but he was listened to by f future presidents yeah. and uh he stuck around for a while he he lived uh to be I think 90 Yeah, he had a pretty long post presidency. See, I think, you know, he was kind of Forgiven for his bad tenure as our nation's 31st chief executive. Um, Pre-presidential, probably much better for Hoover. But yeah. post-presidency, I mean, you know, nothing serious to speak of, really. Yeah, more in the modern sense of post-presidents who pretty much retire yeah. from public life. Tr 
traditionally. He got to meet Hitler, of course. We've talked well, about that. Yeah. So that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Yep, everyone wishes they could meet Hitler. Hoover actually got to fulfill that dream. <laughs> that's it. Um, let's see. President Truman appointed him coordinator of the food supply for world famine in 1946-47. His most prominent activity in retirement was as chairman of the Commission on Organization of the Executive Branch of the Government, popularly known as the Hoover Commission, as well as the Commission on Government Operations, the so-called Second Hoover Commission. Now, these commissions made recommendations to streamline government. And some significant changes included a consolidation of functions into new cabinet-level departments of defense and health, education and welfare, and tighter lines of authority from the office of the president to the rest of the executive branch. Cool. So, there you have it for Herbert Hoover and Martin Van Buren on the other side of the coin here. Yeah, you got Van Buren. He was defeated for re-election and... 1840, but then four years later, he's still kind of the big man in the party and is going to try for uh, another shot at the presidency. Then, of course, he comes out against Texas annexation, which was not uh, a favorite position of his fellow party members. He ends up losing the nomination to James K. Polk. That's he it. Had, uh, turned down Polk's offer to be minister to Great Britain. And then, uh, yeah, Van Buren sticking around, going to make yet another run at the presidency in 48, now as a third-party free soil candidate. That's right. Kind of turning against the Democratic Party that he was instrumental in creating. That's yeah, absolutely. When he thought it was becoming too dedicated to slavery. Um yeah, stood as a third party candidate and maybe siphoned enough democratic votes out in New York that resulted in Zachary Taylor winning the presidency. Well, that, that's just it because uh even though his own term wasn't very successful, uh, kind of uh in common with Hoover there, uh, he was still a huge player in national politics, but even more so in the ever-important state of New York. Yeah. Yeah, he, um, yeah, at one time the consummate party man, and then after, you know, towards the end of his life, he is willing to stand on principle against party. Yeah. Seeing his party as you know, on a path to destruction. That's it. And he stays loyal to the union up until the end. He dies right. in 19 or er, in <laughs> 19. He dies in 1862, uh, and is honored. Yep. Supporting Lincoln and being honored by the union. A good, good way to go out as a Democrat mm -hmm. of that time. That's it. Yeah, Van Buren was always a pretty important figure. I'm leaning towards uh, him taking the hand here. Yeah, I'd probably give it to him as well. It's going to triumph over Hoover. Indeed. We're going to move on to our next category, which will be Best Educated. Okay. I'm going Franklin Pierce. And I went with Benjamin Harrison. Franklin Pierce, uh... Grew up in a pretty prominent New Hampshire family. That's it. His dad was became governor, so he had some good opportunities. Went to some private academies for prep school, and then uh, ended up at Bowdoin with some pretty notable figures. Yep, his Bowdoin college days with his buddy Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Also there, among others. Yeah. A poor student to begin with, but he really turned himself around and dedicated himself and mm -hmm. ended up towards the top of his class. Yeah, it seems like maybe his first couple of years at Bowdoin were more the Animal House Franklin Pierce. Right. That was the uh, number one presidential drinker. 
And then uh, he buckled down and uh, got his work done. And then he ended up uh, studying law, um, you know, in a private law office, as was the custom at the time, and was admitted to the bar. I think uh, Levi Woodbury, future Supreme Court Justice, was one of his tutors in the law. That's right. As for Ben Harrison, uh, he's going to have some pretty decent tutors at home. You know, he's got a pretty good family. He's coming from good stock. He's mm-hmm. learning the basics from some good uh, tutors and local instructors. Then he's going to attend Farmers College, a preparatory school in Cincinnati. He goes on to study at Miami University in Oxford, where he's known as an outstanding public speaker. He'd be elected president of the Union Literary Society and joined the Phi Delta Theta fraternity, graduating near the top of his class. Um, but then he, he decided to go into the law instead of become a minister. Mm-hmm. And he studies law at the Cincinnati office of Storer and Gwen, being admitted to the bar in 1854. So, not too bad. Yeah. Well, pretty solid education. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty close one. Um, yeah. I think maybe Pierce is, is seems a little bit more prestigious. I'm kind of leaning towards that, to be honest. Certainly um, his classmates. Yeah, that's what's kind of doing it for me. And then, you know, studying under Levi Woodbury is pretty good. Um, yeah. And he, he really was like a nice uh, 180 story. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of just... Go on to kind of party and hang out and then realizes he's like in the bottom five of his class and being like really embarrassed and totally Mm -hmm. turning himself around. Yeah. And he ended up, you know, towards the top. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think Pierce takes this. Yep. We're down to two cards to choose from when we're gone. Who had the most accomplished vice president? I'm going to go Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah? Okay. I went with Abraham Lincoln. Um, Nice. Which is kind of a funny one. You know, but I mean, of course you got Hannibal Hamlin. These guys both have two vice presidents. Right. You got Hannibal Hamlin at the beginning there. We can double double up this category, count all four vice presidents. Yeah, that's it. Well, Grant had uh, Schuyler Colfax during his first term who had been a Speaker of the House for uh, six years prior to uh, becoming Vice President. Then, during his Vice Presidency, or wait, yeah, he was involved in the Credit Mobilier scandal that I guess didn't come out till later. Yeah. But he, I think, was bumped from the ticket because he... Uh, talked about maybe being willing to be the candidate if Grant didn't want to run for a second term and then being a little too friendly with the third party liberal Republicans. Yeah. And then second term, uh, Grant had Henry Wilson, who was uh, a longtime Whig, also a free soil. Free Soiler, serving in the uh, U.S. Senate for almost 20 years prior to becoming vice president, hmm. chairman of the Military Affairs Committee during the Civil War. Pretty, pretty important chairman. Jim. Yeah, that's for sure. As for Lincoln, you got Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. He'd been in the House and Senate, of course, and was the first, although briefly, the first Republican governor of Maine. Uh, Now, one thing, during the campaign of 1860, because of his swarthy complexion, uh, rumors spread that Hamlin was uh, part black. Hmm. 
but uh, yeah, that he wasn't. Um, spent little time presiding over the Senate. He was a staunch abolitionist, supported vigorous prosecution of the war. Uh, gets dumped from the ticket in favor of uh, war Democrat Andy Johnson. Yeah, and of course Johnson, as vice president, makes a real ass of himself. But then becomes the president. Yeah. And continued to make an ass of himself. Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. Henry Wilson uh, died in office as vice president. I don't know that either of Grant's vice presidents ever really had much in the way of accomplishments as vice president. Well, Skylar Colfax was... Uh, was a uh, was he he was speaker of the house when the 13th amendment was going through and yeah he made the the bold move to cast a vote regardless i mean usually they only do is it they only do it if there's like a in the event of a tie but he decided to vote anyway because it was history yeah it's they they know. show that in lincoln i'm pretty sure the spielberg huh. lincoln I don't remember that. Could be. But yeah, that's... Yeah, Grant's two vice presidents, pretty important members of Congress during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I give credit to Andy Johnson for staying loyal to the Union. Yeah. You know, because, well, it would have been easy for him not to, yeah. <laughs> considering everybody else from the South. Mm-hmm bolted yeah his specific short tenure as vice president was not uh, very laudatory but the rest of his career prior to that pretty accomplished yeah i mean he stood by what he believed mm -hmm. you know you could say that for him for sure um does it necessarily make him the most accomplished because he did become president and all that i don't know I mean, we're kind of just looking up to the time that they become vice president. But even with that, Andy Johnson, I, I could see why the Lincoln team was okay with having him on the ticket. Mm -hmm. It made sense, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think this category would also encompass pre accomplishments during the vice presidency. Mm -hmm. Just not, I guess, post-vice presidential. Right. Which wouldn't really help Johnson anyway. No. Not too it much. Would probably so. hurt him. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. That's a tough one because uh, really the standouts are Skylar Colfax and Andy Johnson. Yeah, it's pretty close. I don't know. I give Hannibal Hamlin credit as well. Yeah. It's a pretty strong, strong abolitionist. Yeah. Andy Johnson was the only one that Van Heflin played in a movie, though. Yeah. So, there's that. He's got that going for him. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. You want to call this one a tie? Let's call it a tie. This feels like a tie. I'm fine with that, so we got... We'll roll it over. I mean... I may regret calling for a tie when I have to play what my <laughs> last card is. Well, we'll see, because the last category here for this particular draw, who would you rather have date your daughter? Well, I'm going to be forced to have James Buchanan. Okay, and I'm going to be left with Lyndon Baines Johnson. <laughs> wow. Well, So, yeah, here we go. LBJ and uh, Ten Cent Jimmy Buck. Well, you can probably... Feel pretty safe sending your daughter out with James Buchanan and that she will not come back physically violated. Yeah, that's he for sure. He certainly won't lay a finger on her. Probably uh, go to a real nice party or something. Yeah. It will be very gentlemanly. But then, of course, the one woman that he did was engaged to and wooed died under very mysterious circumstances yeah she may have heart... she may have committed suicide yeah possibly heartbroken over his neglect yeah he, he was, was kind of a he was kind of a deke he was pretty focused on his career at yeah, the time yeah 
and went out of town. See, I feel like that would be the way that things would be with Johnson, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was like a straight-up Texan politician, Mm -hmm. you know? He was into that work. And so I feel like a lot more of his time, like Buchanan's, they'd be pretty focused on their careers, Mm -hmm. not so much on, you know, their love life. But, I mean, despite some problems, LBJ did remain, you know, well, basically happily married. I don't know. He might have been happy. I don't know about his wife. <laughs> oh, man, you're not going to knock old Lady Bird. I think she was a real trooper hanging in there. Yeah, definitely. I don't remember all the details, but I know there were some... Yeah, there were some st- issues. ...stories of, of infidelities and and stuff like that. Well, I mean, Johnson is a pretty notoriously crass individual. Yeah. You know, one of our three known presidential penis nicknames. Yeah. With Jumbo. (laughs) He could probably Mm -hmm. win the category biggest presidential cock. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Let me reword that. He could probably win the category biggest executive branch. Yeah. It's possible. I don't know if that works for him or against him in this category. Yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of leaning more towards Buchanan. Mm-hmm. But I'm wishing we could go back to the last hand and have Lincoln and Grant date our daughters. But <laughs> right. We're stuck with what we're stuck with here. That's it. I don't know. Because I think these guys could both kind of be assholes. Yeah. That are focused on themselves and they're the further, you know, the furthering of their career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, who knows with Buchanan and hit, you know, the Buchanan episode, we went into detail about a lot of his other, you know, talk about whether he may have been gay or not. And while maybe he wasn't gay, he certainly wasn't interested in dedicating himself to a woman. Yeah, I think he really enjoyed the company of of women in party settings and whatnot, mm-hmm. you know, and he'd be flirtatious and whatnot, but he never wanted any strings attached. Right. No strings, no connections, no ties to my affections. I'm fancy free and free for anything fancy, says James Buchanan. But he said that all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of leaning towards him here, though. LBJ, I just picture, like, you know, the smoky back rooms where they're making deals and they're stuffing ballot boxes. And, you know, I feel like he'd be more of a dog mm-hmm. than Buchanan. So, therefore, I think the hand and therefore these four cards are going to Mm -hmm. go into james j hamilton here right off to sweeping in this game sweeping that first draw of five but anything could happen in presidential war we're drawing another five we'll see what happens next in the category of looks oh boy who's the hottest president in our new five card hands. All right. I'm going Richard Nixon. All right. He's going up against Thomas Jefferson. Hmm. Thomas Jefferson, pretty tall. Yeah. And as far as gingers go, he's not bad yeah. looking. He's more day walker than ginger. Yeah. yeah. Thomas Jefferson, he seems pretty. He's rather good looking. Yeah. I mean, for his time, he's not too shabby. No. You know. Of course, he's in the pre-photography era, so Mm -hmm. we just have paintings and whatnot to go by. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen a painting of Jefferson and been like, wow, what a dog. No. You know. Well. He's an okay-looking guy. Yeah. Painters want to earn their uh, commissions. Yeah. And then, hmm, Richard Nixon, he's a pretty good-looking young man. 
Look yeah. up some pictures of him when he was younger. He's pretty handsome. Yeah, I mean, if you if you're not thinking about like the, you know, kind of sweating and the jowls flapping. <laughs> yeah. You know. Nixon wasn't a bad looking dude. Mm hmm. Although, yeah, I mean, as he got older, by the time he's president, yeah, he is pretty jowly and sweaty. Yeah. I would think that. Had uh, he was one of those few that, uh, well, you know, as James Mason would say, all the best people shave twice a day. Nixon was in that crowd. Yeah. Where he'd shave in the morning and. By mid afternoon, he would have that kind of five o'clock shadow coming. Mm -hmm. It didn't do him any favors in the televised debates with Kennedy, no, where he refused to wear stage makeup. Yeah, so in contrast with somebody like Kennedy, he didn't come off very well. Well, but well, it's not like Thomas Jefferson, he didn't lose a presidential election because the other guy was better looking. That's true. <laughs> Although I don't think the voters at the time, well, it really wasn't a popular vote type of election, but right. he probably would have won a, a beauty contest against John Adams. Yeah. I don't know. In terms of, you know, a classic aesthetic, I'm leaning towards TJ here. Yeah, I think he probably aged better than Nixon. Yeah. Yeah, has more classic good looks Stephen Lincoln Douglas finally winning a hand Thomas Jefferson triumphing over Nixon and then we're going to go to the category pre-presidential accomplishments man I don't have like anybody good for this one hmm. I've got James Madison oof I went with George W. Bush and George W. Had an interesting pre presidential life. Mm -hmm. He was a successful governor. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, outside of that, you know, hmm. yeah. I mean, James you're, Madison. You're looking at James Madison. Yeah, father of the Constitution. Yeah. George W. Bush, father of the Bush twins. Right. Almost as integral to the nation. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not quite, though. Yeah, Madison's one of the best cards in this category yeah he's up there you know washington could beat him but uh he's mm -hmm. he's top tier in this category yeah madison pretty strong pre-presidential accomplishments yeah washington madison jqa you know some of those guys pre-presidential accomplishments my goodness mm -hmm. i mean he's he's got an easy vic over george w bush here yeah we don't have to to embarrass W by belaboring the point. Yeah, I mean, we know the stories of, you know, causing a ruckus and and turning himself around a bit. And, yeah, you know, I mean, I Is believe that, he I believe he's yeah. considered a pretty successful governor of mm -hmm. of Texas. Uh, it obviously led to him yeah. getting nominated for president. Uh, Madison graduated from Princeton. W banned from Princeton. Yeah, for his antics during a football game. Yeah, <laughs> there you have it. An easy vic for James <laughs> Madison. <laughs> That's gonna bring us to nicest guy. I'll go FDR. I'm going with the ace in the hole, Jimmy Carter. Ouch, Jimmy Carter. Easily the nicest guy that's ever been president. Mm -hmm. I'd say easily. Maybe He's up there. maybe one of the only presidents, maybe the only president that would go to heaven even though he lusted in his heart several times. True. FDR lusted outside of his heart. Yeah. Many times. Yeah, he seemed like a pretty nice guy as well, but definitely not on Jimmy Carter's level. Yeah, I mean, FDR had that image of like, you know, oh, he's, 
you know, the fireside chats and all that. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was, you know, an image, but Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Carter, legitimately nice human being. Yeah. FDR, a little more aristocratic. Yeah. Probably not hobnobbing with the common folks. You Probably really, not so much. No, really knew how to get along with, you know, Churchill and other fellow aristocrats. Yeah, that's it. But yeah, pretty, pretty easy victory for Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Probably so, one of the only categories in which Jimmy Carter yeah. triumphs over FDR. True. So maybe post-presidential accomplishments. Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of accomplishments, our next category is First Lady Accomplishments. I'm going to go with John Adams and thereby Abigail Adams. And I'm going with James Polk and thereby Sarah Polk. Sarah Polk, uh, really well educated for her time, her husband's closest advisor. Actually, it sounds like I could be talking about John Adams. Yeah. Uh, You know, both women were educated. Both had uh, strong opinions. They were both their husband's closest confidant and advisor. Mm -hmm. Uh, Abigail, way ahead of her time. Uh, She is truly a woman for all times. Yeah. In the history of uh, women in America. Uh, Sarah Polk's great. Um, But Abigail Adams, you know. Yeah, is I a mean, fucking legend. Yeah, and I mean, I think they were both really, really great first ladies, really great, like, assets to their husbands yeah. as president. Um, well, they, that's another thing in common with them, is their wives, people loved them. Mm-hmm. If they didn't personally like John Adams or James Polk. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah, these ladies much more likable than their husbands. Absolutely. Actually, this is really cool because they have a lot in common here. There's a good mm-hmm. uh, a good connection between these yeah. two and their wives. You mm-hmm. know, their personalities were, you know, John Adams known as being intolerably stubborn mm-hmm. and argumentative. Yeah. Polk known for being taciturn and devious Mm -hmm. and you know but their wives like in stark contrast you know i I think abigail could probably be a little stubborn and argumentative yeah that's that's true she was maybe not so much softening his image as like doubling down with him that's yeah kind of backing him up that way because she was a target of Opposing party, that's fact. Opposing party criticism. Yeah, that's for sure. I think maybe, I mean, two great first ladies, maybe the tiebreaker between them is Abigail Adams gave birth and raised a president as well. That's right. Whereas Sarah Polk and James K. Polk, childless. That's it. And I think another thing, too, that uh, needs must be said is uh, it's really hard to gauge where Sarah Polk's sympathies lay when you're talking about the Civil War. Mm -hmm. She was aiding Confederates. Yeah. Was was it out of the goodness of her heart that she was just trying to help people that were, you know, not having a good time? Or did she believe that maybe the Southerners, you know, had had cause for what they were doing? It's hard to say. But Mm -hmm. uh, obviously... She had slaves, yeah. yeah. And even after 1863, they stayed and worked for her, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Elias Polk, you know, a real Uncle Tom, yeah. But uh, there were a slew of them that stuck around and worked for her, you know, up, up until the end because she lived until 1893, I believe. Wow, so it had a heck of a long retirement. Post first lady. Mm-hmm. Um, well, so did Abigail. But uh, yeah, yeah. This one very interesting. But I think we got to go Abigail Adams here. Yeah, I think she'll edge out Sarah Polk. It was a good one. It was a great battle, indeed. Down to our last card of this draw, we got biggest election victories. Yikes! Well, I'm going. 
Theodore Roosevelt. And I'm going John Tyler. So, not too much to speak of, uh, you know. Uh, he was governor of Virginia. He won a lot of uh, Senate and yeah. governor elections. Yeah, I mean, he'd been, were, he'd been around for a while. The Senate and probably... If I'm not mistaken, also governor elected by the Virginia State Legislature. That's right. Yeah. So him not really much in the way of popular voting elections. No, no not not a fantastic card to have here. And Teddy Roosevelt, you know, uh, had no trouble. Yeah. Well, his election in... Uh, well, he, he, of course, came in first as a, a vice presidential yeah. successor, and then when he was elected in his own right in 1904, uh, won um, 56% of the vote against Democrat Alton Parker. And he could have won again in 1908, but he made the mistake of considering the completion of McKinley's term his yeah. first term, it, a decision which he regretted right, pretty seriously. But, because he would have won as easily, if not more so than Taft, because yep. he was so popular. Mm -hmm. And then that led to the ill-fated 1912 election where he challenged Taft and yep. enabled Wilson to win, not TR's finest hour certainly in an electoral standpoint. That's for sure. But I think even with that, he's going to uh, eke it out over John Tyler here. Yeah. And he also had a history of, well, he won governor of New York and a seat in the New York State Assembly. Yeah. Pretty successful electorally until 1912. But that's it. It's going to be enough to beat John Tyler. Indeed. Time to draw another five cards. Let's see who we have to work with here. We'll be working in the next category, Biggest Partier. Okay, Biggest Partier. Hmm. I guess I'm going to go Andrew Jackson. There you go. I went with Chet Arthur. So these guys knew how to party. Yeah. Uh, Chet Arthur, always known for a late night, you know, a babyless night on the town. Yep. You know, elegant Arthur. Yeah, he was... All, he was all about dinner parties and... Right. And... He was at Drinking the, and eating. Mm -hmm, the finest establishments out there with his machine politician buddies That's oiling it. up the machine with yeah. copious amounts of liquor and food mm -hmm. staying out till all hours of the night That's i think it. he was known for he would always never he'd always be the last guy up at the end of the night yeah i mean as president he was known for going out for walks through washington at like three in the morning mm. uh jackson on the other hand i mean in his younger days he was a wild boy yeah. I mean, he's going to horse races, he's going to cockfights, he's gambling, he's dancing, he's drinking. Yeah, he got a small inheritance from an uncle and blew, blew through it, it all. <laughs> yeah. In one like huge rager of a yep. of a time. Yeah, the gambling, the cockfighting, dueling. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> these these two horse racing knew how to live it up. Mhm. Mm uh Andrew Jackson kind of Kind of coming more to his senses, I guess. Yeah, these two seem like... Yeah, Jackson was more of like a young, wild party, or yeah. maybe settled down more, whereas it seemed like Arthur kind Arthur of like, kept it he up. Like grew, into, yeah. like grew into it. I don't know that as a younger man he was really doing that kind of thing. I think it was more once once he became a, a politician, became established, yeah. he took up that, that lifestyle. Yeah, I almost want to... Maybe give it to Arthur just because of the longevity of mm -hmm. uh, of it. It wasn't like a phase. Like with Jackson, it could be argued like that was just yeah. how he was when he was young. Yeah, that's true. You know, he'd, he'd had a pretty rough upbringing, mm -hmm. and he was living it up for a spell there. Where Arthur, I mean, just pretty consistently 
with dinner parties and late night strolls and mm -hmm. Which yeah, I don't know that Jackson's throughout. really known for any partying once he kind of became established. Right. Outside of you, the inevitable glass of old crow yeah, you, with <laughs> James K. Polk. Yeah, if you believe the uh, the classic old crow ad where Jackson would be having a, a glass of old crow, uh, undoubtedly. Yeah. <laughs> with uh, James K. Polk. That's it. It's odd that. Andrew Jackson and James K. Polk aren't used to sell liquor anymore yeah. now. But maybe in, I don't know when that ad was, the 60s. Probably. probably. Still interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. Kind of leaning lean towards Chad Arthur here. Yeah, I think we can let Arthur take this one. Move on to a new category. Who would you most like to mate? So I'm going to go... With William Howard Taft. I'm going with George Washington. He's the father of our country. I, th I yeah. mean, if there's any president, like, if you could be like, hey, you could meet any president for mm -hmm. 10 minutes, who would you like to meet? Washington. Yeah. It's, you know, no question. Yeah, he's definitely the man. For sure. He He's the, the man in many categories. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, this one for sure. Taft would be cool to meet. Yeah. Be cool. Wouldn't to mind go meeting out, Taft. Yeah, go out to dinner with him. See how much he can put down. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe try to have like a hot dog eating contest with him. Yeah. Yeah, I think he'd be a cool guy to hang out with. But yeah, definitely George Washington. He's the man you want to meet. That's pretty much it. Washington gonna take it. Yep. Next up, we have best politician. Going Millard Fillmore. Okay. I went with Rutherford Hayes. Uh, by force, pretty much. Uh, mm. The other cards in my hand probably wouldn't have fared well at all. Uh, Rutherford Hayes. Yeah. Lawyer. Civil War veteran. Doing work in Ohio. Um... A pretty standard kind of rise, I would say. Um, whereas yeah. Fillmore, though, I mean, he was really one of the heads in New York state politics there for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hayes, with his war record coming in almost as a more statesmanlike candidate, like yeah. he, he's a war hero, kind of a, not figurehead, but... In a way, it's like this is the guy that we need to win the election in Ohio. Right. Um, rather, you know, Fillmore is more on the kind of party level right. politic side. Yeah, Hayes, U.S. representative and uh, governor of Ohio. Fillmore, I mean, him, Thurlow Weed, uh, they're huge players in New York state politics at the time. Mm -hmm. Fillmore was pretty important. Yeah. He served about, what, eight years in the House of Representatives. A lot of, uh, you know, big party man in New York. Yeah. One of the leaders of the Whigs vying for control of New York. And what a complicated time, too. Yeah. You know, he had to be a good politician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he kind of got himself, r r rose up through the ranks through his, his political skill. That's it. Because, yeah, it wasn't like... He's like a very popular, charismatic guy who all the nation is beating down their door to vote for Millard Fillmore, but yeah. he just politically positioned himself to be, I mean, he, be the guy he, who they turn to for vice president. Yeah, and I mean, he's known as an affable guy. He's pretty likable. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, in terms Maybe of... Maybe neither, uh, neither of them necessarily great politicians as president. Yeah. Maybe that was probably where Fillmore kind of got above his pay grade and where his political skills ran out. Yeah. And then Hayes really at war with kind of the leaders of his own party. Yeah. Not uh, very tactful, although he stood, you know, for what he stood for. That's it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm leaning towards Fillmore here just because of... Uh, his role in New York at the time and as complicated as 
the Whig Party was at the time and politics in general, you mm -hmm. know. It was just there was a lot more going on, I think, in Fillmore's yeah. role. Yeah, I'd probably give it to Fillmore. And if I recall, these two faced each other last game in the best looks category. Oh. Fillmore also winning. Seems like a rivalry building up between these two. Yeah. Maybe needs to play out in the in the PWF squared circle. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe there Hayes can get his revenge. <laughs> That's going to bring us to most underrated. I guess we'll have to get out our little C-SPAN 2018 ranking. Yeah, our historian list. historians rankings. Oh wow! I've, we've got two cards in our hand to choose from. I think one of my guys is rather pretty overrated on this list. Yeah, that's so. um, well. I mean, one of my guys I would say is definitely top 10 but he's pretty high on there uh and the other one is <laughs> probably getting generous treatment so um hmm. not, well gonna have to bite the bullet with this one well, i'm going james monroe and i went with william henry harrison william henry harrison getting a generous ranking of 38 yeah Considering the brevity of his administration, um, they have yeah. him ranked above John Tyler on this list, which I don't think but, is something uh, I agree with. Well, and then he's below Hoover, Fillmore. Well, yeah, considering the brevity of his administration, you pretty much can only rank him against presidents that you think are like net negative. Right. Because <laughs> Harrison really forced to be pretty neutral. And then James Monroe's at 13 here. Yeah. Which might be, you know, n near near where he belongs but then this list has several people ahead of him who probably should not be the ones who are kind of um, yeah. more overrated wilson uh lyndon johnson john f kennedy like i would think monroe is probably above them yeah but then there's some people below him that you could probably put above him as well like polk he's right right above polk yeah we're big polk fans here yeah, it's an interesting list to say the least. Um I kind of feel like you got to go Monroe here. Um just because there's not really much of an argument for William Henry Harrison. I mean, a lot of times he's not even ranked at all. Yeah. Cuz he was only in there for a month. Mhm. Mm and part of that time he was sick in bed. So, you know, Mm -hmm. Basically, the only things you could say for Harrison's presidency was he was at least standing up against Henry Clay. He wasn't going to be like the servile tool of, you know, a shadow president in Henry Clay. Yeah. William Henry Harrison intended to be the president, but, you know, mm -hmm. he died instead. Uh, Monroe, I mean, yeah, maybe underrated on this list Monroe I don't well it's a, he's at 13 here I mean if he's not top 10 he's really damn close to it uh, yeah. I don't know I, I think he wins this hand yeah I think so too I mean there's several people on this list that are above him who probably shouldn't be and there's probably maybe several below him that we might put ahead of him yeah. too. So he's these two both kind of appropriately rated on this list, maybe. Yeah. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more. I mean, it just doesn't seem right to see uh, Monroe below Barack Obama at this point, <laughs> and Wilson, and Woodrow Wilson, um, and even LBJ. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, well, there you have it. 
But I think in any event, James Monroe wins the hand. And that'll bring us to Best Statesman. Well, I have the aforementionedly overrated Woodrow Wilson. There you go. And I'm I'm left with Dwight D. Eisenhower. Um, hmm. I mean, I think right off the bat, you got to go. You got to go Wilson. His role in World War One, what he was trying to do with the League of Nations, uh, the big four over there. Mm. Well, he he had to be a statesman, and you know you look at look at the photos and stuff from him going to France and stuff. He was, mm -hmm. he was super mean, popular there. He um, certainly acted as a statesman and saw himself as a statesman. I think he may be overreached a little. Yeah, um, of course, coming back with the League of Nations and the United States not joining it. Right, and then. <laughs> All of his work done to, you know, settle World War One, you know, and that post-war settlement being, like, the major cause of World War Two. Right. <laughs> so it really was not not a successful post-war settlement. Yeah. Um, Eisenhower, he's dealing with the Cold War. But he just doesn't... Being, being effective in your role... And being a quote unquote statesman mm -hmm. is a little bit different. I don't, when I look at Eisenhower, I don't think of like, oh, he was a great statesman, great politician. Not mm -hmm. really. He was an effective president. I'd say he's a good president. Yeah. Very strong first term. Uh, you know, he's, he's among the better presidents, but he just doesn't strike me as like, a statesman, not in the, I mean, not in the way that Wilson kind of had to be. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if Eisenhower was, you know, called upon to do the same kind of things, he probably would have done a good job. But yeah. He just didn't, yeah, didn't have different, much, different opportunities, yeah. you know? Yeah. Wilson had, yeah. What he what he was doing was w one of the biggest like stages for statesmanship of uh, that any president has been on. Yeah. Well, it didn't necessarily work all out work great. Out great. You know, I mean, he was he was doing his part. I think. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. I mean, keeping us out of the war for m most of it was a pretty good move. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's going to eke it out here. You know, was Wilson a... I mean, that's it's not the... The category isn't who was a better president, you know? Yeah. it's comes down to statesmanship, and Wilson just had more opportunities to be a statesman, to be in that role, than Eisenhower did. Yeah. I think he takes it. Yeah. You can give it to him here. Another five cards... Their category, First Lady Looks. Okay. First Lady Looks. Going Grover Cleveland. Okay. You got That's Francis Cleveland first there. Term, first term Grover Cleveland, which means we get... A fresh bride. Fresh 21-year-old Francis Cleveland. <laughs> and she's going up against Jackie O. Ouch. Jackie Kennedy. Jackie Kennedy Onassis, a, a very attractive lady. Indeed. Absolutely amongst our most attractive first ladies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. two yeah, two first ladies that kinda had similar roles or kind of images that were very beloved by the public. Yeah. Especially for their relative youth and beauty and being young young mothers at the time they were first lady. I mean, I got to go Jackie Kennedy. Yeah, I mean, it. it's really hard to argue with that. I'm a pretty big Francis Cleveland fan, but yeah. I don't know that I could argue for her over Jackie Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah, nothing against her, but we're talking about Jackie Kennedy, you yeah. know. Frank Cleveland going to go down. That's it. 
And that's going to bring us to Best Businessman. Hmm. Yeah, this is actually... I got like three viable options for this. I don't know that I really have any much viable options. I don't know that any of these guys are really... much businessman at all. I'm going to go... I'm going Calvin Coolidge. Okay. I went with uh, Andy Johnson. Nice. Uh, yeah, Johnson. He's He was a tailor, obviously, to begin with. Uh, so... That's some real business when you, when you know, yeah. when you think of business outside of politics. Yeah, he started as an apprentice tailor and, you know, consolidated a tailoring empire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, a, on a small scale, but yeah, and then turned that into real estate investments, diversifying his portfolio. Yeah. Starting from nothing and really... Uh, turning himself into a pretty wealthy man yeah. through private and, sector work. Well, yeah, and that, like, allowed him to meet a lot of people, which he, you know, helped him politically. Mm -hmm. As for Coolidge, I mean, we talked to, well, we haven't talked about it too awful much, but we went to, up to Plymouth Notch to the old Coolidge homestead and, in fact, the whole preserved little village. Yeah. And... The cheese factory that his dad started is back there. I mean, he was no stranger to work. Yeah. Calvin Coolidge, like, you know, he was working on the farm and. Mm hmm. Yeah, certainly a hard worker and then became a lawyer. Uh, but, uh, you know, he had his own law office for a little bit, but his co career was pretty pretty solidly in politics and government yeah. service. Not a lot of business going on. Um, yeah, he was a lawyer. Then he was on Northampton City Council, city solicitor, uh, clerk of courts, chairman of the Republican Party locally, uh, then state, uh, state legislature, mayor, state senator, Lieutenant Governor, mm -hmm. really rising up through the ranks. Never lost an but, election. Wow. You know. But not really much in the way of business to compete against Andy Johnson. Yeah, we got to give it to uh, the Tennessee Taylor. Andy Johnson going to take it over Calvin Coolidge. And that'll bring us to Most Devious. I guess I'm going to go... Again with Grover Cleveland. Ooh. I got second term Cleveland. That's that's a pretty good one, and I'm going to go ahead and flog a dead horse. And, you know, even though I'm still alive, it doesn't mean I won't be killed by Bill Clinton. Yep. Who I, I mean, Bill Clinton murdered a guy. Yeah. It is a matter of public record, according to The View. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Stephen Lee and Douglas murdered on the, our last presidential war episode. Yeah, but it takes more than a couple of Clintons to kill Stephen Lincoln Douglas. Yeah. But uh, there, can, there can be some arguments made for Cleveland here. Uh, you know, his second term is when he had his secret... Surgery. Yeah. He was diagnosed with cancer of the mouth, not telling anyone about it, getting surgery to replace a huge part of his jaw, totally secret. Um, yeah, and remained that way for decades. You know, giving BS stories about how he was having a tooth removed. Yeah, no, is that... See, I, it's, it's tough. I don't know if that's devious or just like really irresponsible. Um, well, I mean, it could. I mean, it. I mean, it could just be smart to not cause. Like, I suppose panic among the nation, um, but I don't know. It just can. I guess there's a negative connotation to the word devious, but just that he's yeah. like sneaking around, mm -hmm. lying and. Yeah, and uh, I mean, if you things. read the book by the guy that was a producer for Inside Edition, you might think that Cleveland is, like, very devious. Yeah. 
And I'd say maybe, I mean, some other things, like maybe his handling of the Pullman strike could be considered devious. Yeah. His uh, his attorney general was a, a major railroad lawyer. He, right. So he puts that guy in charge of breaking the railroad strike, mm-hmm. and they go get a court injunction to make it illegal to be striking and then start arresting <laughs> Uh, the leaders of the strike. That's it. While sending in the army. Yeah, that could that could totally be seen as uh, devious. But does yeah. it hold a candle and to then, Bill Clinton? Uh, well, and then if, and then if, I want to mention Coxie's army where right. he marched, and then he ended up being arrested for being on the lawn of the Capitol. Yeah. Um, it's like a little bit of an underhanded way to deal with that issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think the argument could be made for Cleveland there, but I just don't know that it holds a candle to, you know, Bill Clinton. Yeah. I Bill mean, Clinton. Definitely. If not a murderer, st- certainly a note, a notable, one of the bald-faced most liars. Yeah. <laughs> um, as president. Yeah. Lying under oath and yeah. you know not known for his marital fidelity no. by any stretch. Yeah, deviously lied to Hillary about the Monica Lewinsky thing for a while until he was forced to come clean. Yeah, and there's some nasty stories about you know him being governor of Arkansas. I mean, it's just you know mm-hmm. there's a whole laundry list of yeah dirty laundry. Mm-hmm. For yeah, Bill Clinton, there, yeah, he's a great a, he's a great card for this category. Mm, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of smoke there. Mm-hmm. You think there has to be some fire? Yeah, that's it. I think Clinton's gonna take it. Yeah, I think he's gonna out devious Cleveland. Yep. And that is going to bring us to who would win in a fight? Oh. I wish I had Grover Cleveland back. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go with William McKinley. I'm going to go with George Bush. Mm. All righty. So, uh, tale of the tape here. Uh, George Bush, six foot two, weighing about 195 pounds. Well, uh, you yeah. know, he's known as the wimp president, but he was far from it. Mm-hmm. He's a veteran uh, and an athlete, not... You know, nothing to sneeze at yeah, is George Bush. Pretty active athlete. He's Mm -hmm. on our top five most athletic presidents. Um, McKinley, also a veteran. His weight, very similar to George H.W. Bush, weighing in at about almost 200 pounds. But his height, five foot seven. Mm. So these two presidents weigh about the same, but uh, H.W. has got about six, seven inches (laughs) On McKinley. Yeah, and probably a much better reach, too. Oh, yeah. Definitely going to be a big reach advantage. McKinley had, like, something of a punch. Yeah. McKinley, you know, he did serve with distinction in the Civil War, but outside of that, you know, there's not really much physically uh, imposing about him. Mm -mm. He was not very active. in any exercise or sports. Um, he was plagued with uh, what doctors referred to as a tobacco heart. Yeah. Needed some of Dr. Duran's tablets. Indeed. But I don't think he's going to have them in time for this fight, mm. and I think. Yeah, George H.W. Bush, former PWF tag team champion. Yeah. We've seen how he's handled himself in the squared circle. I don't know that William McKinley would really be much competition to him. That's it. He's going to take it. Mm. All righty. Mm. Last, last card, card in this in hand. This hand yeah. And we have best president overall. Ouch. Well, I thought ouch when I saw it as well, so we'll see... How this plays out. I got John Quincy Adams. I got Warren Harding. Mm. Yeah. Well, I was hope you know, there's some categories that JQA would be one of the top yeah. contenders in. He's not really a top contender for best president overall, but I think he can handle Warren Harding. Yeah, he could handle Warren Harding. Um, 
as far as JQA goes, he had some awesome ideas. He just didn't get to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Harding was pretty dismal. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah, a lot of corruption yeah. coming back onto him. He's to, he's towards the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. When it comes to U.S. presidential rankings, uh, you know, JQA didn't have a he didn't have a great time of it. But yeah, the uh, rankings that we talked about earlier from the C-SPAN historians, uh, Warren Harding is number forty. Only Pierce, Buchanan, and Andy Johnson below him. Hmm. Whereas JQA, number 21, actually perhaps rather overrated. Perhaps. <laughs> uh, as a specifically his presidency. Yeah. But, yeah, I think he's going to handle Warren Harding here. Yeah, I think so. Not going to have any problem there. That's going to bring us to our final two cards and our final two categories. It all comes down to this. We have Most Accomplished Parents. I know one of my cards said is I'm not going to play because I think I know something. This one I don't know as much about, but I'm going to have to go with it. Harry Truman. All righty, and I went with Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor's father, Richard Taylor, was a planter and public official, served in the Continental Army during the Revolution, rising to lieutenant colonel. He participated in the battles of White Plains and Brandywine, moved the family from Virginia to near Louisville, Kentucky, came to own more than 10,000 acres of land in various parts of Kentucky, mm -hmm. He would serve as a justice of the peace, a county magistrate, a state legislature, and by the appointment of President Washington, collector of the Port of Louisville. He was a Democratic Republican and supported Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. In 1824, he supported Henry Clay. He would die when his most famous son was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. Taylor's mother, Sarah Dabney Struther Taylor, raised in Culpeper County, Virginia, well-educated woman for her time and place. She married Richard Taylor, who at 35 was nearly twice her age. Her hands were permanently disfigured in an accident when molten lead was spilled on her while she was making bullets. Wow. Wow. And she also died when Taylor was a lieutenant colonel in the army. Hmm. Not too shabby. Taylor's father, pretty. Yeah, Taylor's pretty father. Pretty successful. Pretty successful there. 10,000 acres of land. Mm hmm. Whereas Truman's parents, a little more shabby. His father, John Anderson Truman, was a farmer, livestock salesman, um, was pretty successful in those trades until he suffered a huge financial loss speculating in commodities in 1901 ended up working as a night watchman dabbling in farming again uh he strained himself rolling a boulder off the road and died soon thereafter wow when his son harry was also a farmer that was 1914 when he died <laughs> Mm, his, he was a self-educated man, active Democrat. Truman's mother, Martha, was born in 1852 uh, in Missouri in a pro-Confederate household. Wow. As it says here in the complete book, A U.S. President's never overcame her resentment at the indignities her family suffered at the hands of the Yankees. Wow. She refused to... When uh, she lived to be 94... Uh, oh, Mother Truman died during her son's term as president. That's an accomplishment in itself. Yep. But then when she uh, was a guest at the White House, refused to sleep in Lincoln's bed. Harboring that bitterness. Yep. Holding on to resentment. And that's pretty I, interesting. Yep. I think probably the Taylors. Yeah, I think Richard they're, Taylor. They're going to run away with this one. Going to take it. 
that'll bring us to our yeah. final card and final category. We have most accomplished children. Damn it. I've got Ronald Reagan. There you go, and he's going up against Barack Obama. Now, this has happened a couple of times now. Yeah. Uh, well, it's happened at least once, and I think another time I avoided doing it, uh, mm -hmm. because we've talked about Sasha and Malia Obama. Um, they're just too young to have really made their mark. The world is their oyster, uh, but... Mm -hmm. They haven't started to suck it yet. No, they're still a blank slate. Or should I say, slurp it down? Well, is that one what one does with an oyster? You perhaps. slurp it down more than you suck it. Yep. Well, Ronald Reagan had uh, four children. Well, I think he may have had another child who died shortly after birth, but he had four children who lived including Maureen Reagan with his first wife who um, she had a 16 year career in show business as a hostess of radio and television talk shows founded a magazine became executive director of Sell Overseas America an organization supporting American businesses was active in the California Republican Party, served as a party co-chairman, wrote a book, First Father, First Daughter, also insisted that she and her husband had seen Lincoln's ghost in the White House. Hmm. Probably came to get revenge on Martha Truman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Reagan's son, Michael Davis... Let's see, worked as a boat salesman, part owner of a gasoline development firm, a bit part actor, TV talk show host, professional speedboat racer. Hmm. Another son, Ronald Prescott Reagan, was a dancer dropping out of Yale to study ballet. Probably not the kind of thing parents would be thrilled about joined uh, Good Morning America as an entertainment reporter. And then you got Patty Davis, an actress who um, appeared in just one television film, landing minor roles in other films in regional theater productions and infamously posing for Playboy magazine. <laughs> so... Maybe that almost enough to drag the Reagan brood down below the non-accomplishments of the Obamas, because say what you will about <laughs> Sasha and Malia, neither of them have been in Playboy, nor are they likely to be. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, it's uh, almost unfair um, for Obama at this point. Yeah. As of now, they're probably still gonna have to lose this category yeah yeah unfortunately i think so but maybe in future seasons of the podcast we'll watch them closely and see what they accomplish that's just it up their value in presidential war absolutely and that is going to bring us to the card count <laughs> I ended up with 18. And I had 26. And yet again, James J. Hamilton, victorious in presidential war. It was a, it was a close game. 
But most importantly, and as always, an interesting game. Right. Hopefully our listeners learned some new things and yep. enjoyed our discussion. They are the real winners. Absolutely. They've That's had always their, the case. Their presidential bodily fluids replenished. Indeed. And made safe from the international communist conspiracy. That's right. Which is... That makes us all winners. Yes. For the Dead Presidents Podcast, I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. And I'm James J. Hamilton. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.